When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice in keeping him, or to said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts, and the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. My eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marvelled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, saying, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that we spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and, there, and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. And when Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. Father, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for these words from Luke. And we ask that you would speak to us now by your Spirit and give us ears and hearts to listen in his name. Amen. I do have a confession to make at the beginning of this uh, sermon. Um, it's a complete accident that today's reading is the proper one. Um, I discovered this on Monday. Uh, I, I have a blog that I follow, and uh, every week they, they publish um, uh, some notes for people who are, are, who are preaching on the lectionary. And on Monday, I thought, oh, that's what I'm preaching on and realised that uh, I'd managed to choose the correct reading. So you are truly blessed by that coincidence. Um, as uh, Bobby said, we reached the end of this short series uh, looking at the first couple of chapters of Luke. Um, it's kind of weird because I, I haven't actually preached for weeks uh, because uh, my dear brother Chris stood in for me at, uh, at the beginning of January when I wasn't very well. Um, so I'm going to include just a little bit of what I was going to say <laughs> Uh, back at the beginning to help sort of end the series today. Um, see, for over 400 years before these events happened, there had been no new prophet. There had been no word from God to his people Israel since these words through Malachi. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. It's quite a cliffhanger, isn't it? But you didn't know they were invented by God through an Old Testament prophet. Those words, and then they waited for 400 years. What's the, what, what the longest is that you've ever waited for something? 400 years? Maybe not. I confess um, I'm so bad at waiting, I get annoyed if a traffic light takes more than about 30 seconds to go green. 400 years of waiting. And then suddenly there is this explosion of activity. We have angels, we have miracles, we've got babies, we've got songs of praise, words of prophecy. Something new, something exciting was happening. It was marked by this explosion um, in these first couple of chapters. Last week we made it to the end of chapter 1 and the birth of John, and now we skip forward a few months. Uh, so we've had Quirinius, the census, the angels, the shepherds, the, the swaddling cloths, and Mary treasuring all these things in her heart, and we arrive at verse 22. 
And we begin in verse 22 with Joseph and Mary uh, travelling to Jerusalem with Jesus, with their newborn baby. And there they performed two separate ceremonies required by the law. Uh, One of those was the consecration of the firstborn male. Uh, uh, Luke quotes uh, from Exodus there in verse 23. Um, As part of the original Passover, every firstborn male, sorry ladies, had to be redeemed at the cost of five shekels. You know what a shekel is? It was a piece of silver. Five shekels weighed about 58 grams. So worth about 30 pounds. I looked up the price of silver, and uh, that's about 30 pounds in today's money. And uh, this was a reminder of of what happened, if you remember, with the plagues. The final plague was the the death of the firstborn. And it was a reminder of the way God rescued them from slavery in Egypt. If you're interested, uh, the rules for all that is in Exodus 13. The other ceremony that they performed was the purification rites, the purification of the mother. After giving birth, mothers had to wait 40 days and then offer a sacrifice of a lamb and a pigeon as a sign of being ceremonially clean again. If you want to look those up, they're in Leviticus 12. And if the mother couldn't afford a lamb, she could offer a pigeon instead. Hence, Luke mentions in verse 24, two doves or young pigeons. Now, I've heard preachers make much of the fact that Mary gave the poor person's sacrifice, the two pigeons. Except the thing is, in the Roman Empire, pretty much everybody was poor. Um, There wasn't really a middle class like there is now. You had very poor people, and then you had kings and lords, and there wasn't really much in between. The second thing was that Joseph was a carpenter, So actually, he probably earned a little bit more than many who were day labourers would have earned. But more importantly, Luke makes absolutely nothing of their poverty. He's far more interested in something else. Luke says, across the course of this reading, verse 23, when the time came for the purification rites required by the law, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem. Verse 27, When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, verse 39, when Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord. Luke doesn't mention their poverty, but he goes out of his way to talk about their piety. They took pains to do things properly, to follow God and his requirements carefully. Now, they didn't really need to do that, did they? I mean, Nazareth is the complete opposite end of the country to Jerusalem. So had they wanted to, they could have bypassed Jerusalem and just gone straight home and pretended that they'd done the ceremonies and no one would have been the wiser. But they didn't. I think it's significant that God chose this everyday, committed, devout, pious family to raise his son. I mean, think about it. He could have had, he had his pick of all the families in Israel, and he chose this one. Is it any wonder that by chapter 40, Luke says, the child grew and became strong and was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. That wasn't just the work of God within his son, through the spirit. That was also, I think, the nurturing Uh, devout nature of the family that he was being raised in. But Luke's concern to talk about piety doesn't end with Joseph and Mary. Uh, In verse 25, we meet Simeon, who was righteous and devout. God had promised he wouldn't die before he'd seen the Messiah. We don't know how long he'd waited. Church tradition has him very, very old. You know, you have him stained glass windows with big white beards and stuff like that. We don't actually know he was old, but certainly it's implied. We meet a man, he'd lived a godly life, he listened to God, and he trusted God. Then we met Anna. She was very old, Luke says, at least 84 years old. If you think that doesn't sound very old, uh, you can take it up with Luke in heaven. She'd been a widow for many decades, 
It's kind of a hard bit of Greek to translate. She'd either been a widow until she was 84, or she'd been a widow for 84 years, which puts her somewhere over 100. So she'd been a widow for many decades, and Luke says in verse 37, she never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. She never missed a service. She was at every single prayer meeting. Even vicars don't manage that. And she fasted as well. Her private life matched up to the way she practised her faith in public. Joseph, Mary, Simeon, Anna, these were good people. They were ordinary people whose hearts and whose lives were focused on God, on living for God, on praising God. It's therefore no surprise that unlike the religious leaders later in Jesus' life, these recognised what God was doing in Jesus. It's not because they were clever, it's not because they were educated, it's because their hearts were focused on God. Rich or poor, it didn't matter. What mattered was their heart. I commend that example to you. Uh, when I was at school, my family, uh, we, uh, we walked guide dog puppies. Uh, every 12 to 18 months, we'd, uh, we'd be brought a new puppy uh, to distract us from having to give the old one back, which is very sad. Uh, they were a mix of dogs, um, Labradors, Retrievers, Labrador Retriever Crosses, some black, some golden, some male, some female, some small, some big, some very big. Sometimes when they were little, uh, we'd take them out for a walk once they'd had their jabs and everything. Uh, and some of them, they would just simply sit or lie down if they'd got a bit fed up. They'd look at you and go, oh, no, I'm done. Uh, usually, you could sort of cajole them to, you know, come on, get up. Sometimes you had to drag them a bit. Uh, once or twice, you had to actually pick them up and just walk with them for a bit until they got fed up or smelled something they liked, and then they'd walk again. Uh, then they get bigger and stronger. And then you have the opposite problem. Uh, there were one or two of them that were so big and so strong, uh, they could literally pull mum off her feet and did a couple of times down at the park. Um, even I struggled, I was a lot bigger than mum uh, by the time I got to 17, even I struggled not to be dragged by these, these dogs. <laughs> Whether it's lying down and refusing to move or wrenching someone's arm out of their socket, neither of those is much good for a guide dog. I'm sure you can agree. The puppy has to learn how to walk with a human at the end of a lead. They have to learn how to walk at the owner's pace not at the speed at which they want to get to the park. They have to learn to go where the owner goes. There was one time I was walking Peter, he wanted to go to the park, but I was going for a country walk down one of the lakes. And he would, I was kissed to come on this way. He wanted to go that way towards the park, I wanted to go that way. They had to learn how to go where their owner wanted. And being a disciple is a little bit like that. It is a partnership between the work of the Holy Spirit and our own willingness and efforts to walk alongside him. We need to learn how to listen to God, to follow where he leads, to walk alongside him and not head off whenever and wherever we want to go. We've already seen how Simeon was a model of piety, but there's something else that Luke says about him that's every bit as important. Verse 25. There was a man called Simeon, and the Holy Spirit was on him. Verse 26, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he'd seen the Lord's Messiah. Verse 27, moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. This man had a special gift of the Holy Spirit. It's highly unusual for someone in the Bible to be described by this before Pentecost. And Luke describes a, a sort of a partnership between the work of the Holy Spirit and Simeon himself. The Spirit was on him, he was righteous and devout. The Spirit revealed to him that he wouldn't die before seeing the Messiah, and he believed it. The Spirit moved him to go to the temple at exactly the right time, and he went. Do you see that partnership that was going on? And friends, this is how God works in his people. There is no magic spell to make everything super easy. Sorry. 
we aren't living in Harry Potter land. But neither are we left to struggle on in our own weaknesses. The Spirit was at work in Simeon and, of course, Anna, who arrived at precisely the right moment. Did you spot that? The Spirit was at work, but they were willing. They listened. They obeyed. Now, I mostly experienced the Spirit's guidance like I imagine they probably did on that day. A little nudge to do this, to go there, to say that. Once or twice, I've had a very strong sense of exactly what God wants me to do. Most of the time, I don't. Most of the time, it's much harder to tell. Sometimes I miss that nudge. Sometimes I don't miss it, but I ignore it. I pray that most of the time I hear and follow it. But like guide dog puppies, we have to learn how to walk in step with the Spirit, as Simeon did and as Anna did. It takes deliberate effort and time to learn this, and I'm afraid it also takes uh, stillness and quiet. Because life is so loud and so busy, and it's so easy for everything that we have to do to crowd out those little nudges that make it really easy to miss them. And if we've got so much to do, even when we might possibly hear one of those nudges, oh no, I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. We need to learn how to make that space, both literally in terms of the time, but also within our hearts to be able to listen to God's leading. Obviously, we need to do stuff. Simeon had to actually go into the temple courts, didn't he, uh, to meet Jesus. He actually had to do something. But he had to listen first. Because there's no use him going over to the, one of the, 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 the temple gates. He'd be in the wrong place. No use him going into the temple courts on the day before, because he'd miss them. First we need to listen, and then we need to obey, then we need to go. So however works for you, can I encourage you to find a way that works for you to make that time, to make that space, to quiet yourself so you can listen. Two priests stood by the side of the road holding a sign saying, the end is near, turn before it's too late. A car slowed down as it neared them. The driver wound down his window and yelled, leave us alone you religious nuts. And with that he sped past. From round the corner they heard a splash. One priest said to the other, do you think it would have been better for the sign to say, collapsed bridge instead? <laughs> Simeon's prayer is famous as the nunc dimittis, which are the first two words in Latin. Along with the Magnificat, Mary's song, and the Benedictus, Zechariah's song in chapter 1, it is often used as part of formal prayer services, uh, often at night prayer or compline. And it is a wonderfully tender prayer. Simeon holds the baby Jesus in his arms. Verse 28. Do you spot that? Simeon took him in his arms and praised God. And he says, verse 30, My eyes have seen your salvation. What's he looking at? A baby. It's not some abstract thing. Oh, I know now. His eyes had literally seen salvation from God. You see, for Simeon, salvation wasn't simply a plan. It was a person, and he was holding that person. Salvation was a baby named Jesus, the name which means God saves. Here at last, now, Simeon says. It's kind of a shame, actually, in the English translations it doesn't begin with the word now. In Greek, it begins now. Dismiss your servants in peace. It's, it doesn't quite work so well in English. God has fulfilled his promises now in this baby. God has brought his light and glory into the world now in this baby to reveal and to save. 
Everything Simeon says in this prayer is directed at God. I don't know if you spotted that. Seven times he says, you, you have promised. You may dismiss your servant, your salvation, which you have prepared, your people, Israel. How we pray reveals our heart. And Simeon's heart was pointing at God. That's why he praised. It is a wonderful prayer. A tender moment between Simeon, whether he was an old man or not, and this young family and this baby. Yet it isn't all he says. We saw just now that God doesn't do everything by himself. We have a part to play as well. The spirit works in us. Our part is to listen, trust and obey. As Simeon prayed this prayer, salvation is all God's work. It was his promise. He's prepared it. It is all his. The question for us is this. How will we respond? Because Simeon carried on. Verse 34. This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. In Jesus, salvation is offered to all nations, but it is not received by all. Many will rise, Simeon says, the same word for resurrection, but others will fall. The hard truth is that how we respond to Jesus reveals the deepest truth about ourselves. The hard side to redemption is the animosity, the, the great cost, the conflict, the enmity, the opposition that Jesus faced first, that his followers face as well. The fact that not everyone recognises or welcomes Jesus as Simeon did. Jesus strips everything away to reveal our hearts, to reveal what we are truly like. It is terrifying and it is wonderful because he still loves us when he does that. No matter what he sees, his heart is full of love. How will you respond to that? Will you respond to Jesus with open arms, like Simeon? I pray you will. We've seen today some wonderful examples of various different people, old and young, men and women, living godly lives in piety and trust. We've seen how the Spirit works in partnership with us, how we need to make time to listen and obey as he prompts us. And we've seen that we need to respond to all God has done for us in Jesus, to that wonderful love, and to accept so great a salvation with open arms. I wonder this week, can we as a church family grow to be a little bit more like Simeon and Anna, Mary and Joseph? Can we respond to Jesus with open arms? Amen.